Okay, so let me get back to where we were. We'll um, kind of review what we talked about on Friday and pick up. We're not done with magnification. So you know, we've got to talk about magnification and digital age and kind of review some stuff that we talked about on Friday. So geometric factors are where we are. We're still on magnification. So we talked about um, uh, magnification, what it is, and that is it's not considered size distortion. Distortion it is size distortion. And whether or not we actually see it on the image, we'll, we'll talk about that today. Um, whether or not we can visualize it on a digital image and identify it as magnification is, you know, there, there are a lot of things at play there. So we'll talk about what those things are. But anytime we have magnification, we have a decrease in sharpness reported detail. Remember, we've got two words. We've got umbra and penumbra. And they mean exactly the opposite thing. So what we want is an image that shows good umbra. We want to minimize pun umbra. So we want to increase the sharpness of recorded detail. Umbra good, pun umbra bad. So uh, magnification increases as SID decreases. So uh, naturally the inverse is true. So if we want to decrease magnification, we want to increase SID. Increases in OID increase magnification and also the inverse is true. So if we uh, decrease OID, we're gonna increase, uh, uh, okay, okay, hang on a second. In increase OID, we're gonna uh, increase magnification. If we decrease OID, we're gonna decrease magnification. So then applying the sharp sharpness of recorded detail of that, if we increase SID, we're gonna increase sharpness of recorded detail. And if we decrease OID, we're gonna increase sharpness of we talked a little bit about uh, body habitus, body thickness, body position, um, uh, you know, the, the anatomical orientation to the central ray. Uh, we took a look at, at uh, wrist bones and, and also uh, spinal projections in context of that. Um, we're also going to talk about, you know, some, we're, we're going to get back into body thickness and its effect, especially on, on magnification. Uh, we talked a little bit about object shape. One of the things that I did not mention, I don't think I mentioned, um, is that uh, not only object shape where we have conical shaped uh, you know, anatomy, it's, it's best to put that anatomy where it, uh, the shape of the anatomy closely follows the vertex of the central ray in, in as much as we can. So conical shape, wrist bones, we, if we really want to see the, the wrist bones without penumbra, we would shoot AP. Right, because they're thinner on the, the anterior surface than what they are on the posterior surface. But there's one shape that we can't overcome, and that is something that's round or spherical, uh, because you just can't put anything closest to the image receptor. So things like head, you know, our head, we're always gonna have an increase in OID, because it's relatively round, it's really more oval, um, egg-shaped even, but we, there's nothing that we can put on a, an AP projection. There's, there's no way that we cannot have an increase in OID, right? So um, that's a registry testable question. Uh, you know, I, I like to say that if, it, if it's in a registry review books, there's a very good chance it's gonna be on a registry and this is one of those things. Round structures, I think it's really better to say spherical, but round st structures are always gonna show an increase in uh, magnification and decrease in sharpness or recorded detail for that reason. You can't get the thickest part, no matter what you do, closest to the image receptor. So we talked about two different ways we calculate magnification. We have uh, magnification factor and what, what we're looking at in magnification factor is a percentage of magnification, right? So if we have mag magnification factor of one, that means that we don't have any magnification present, but we always have magnification. So what we're gonna have is magnification factor greater than one. So 1.01 would demonstrate very little magnification, but it's still present, right? Because the, the only way that we could possibly not have magnification would be to have pencil thin, a pencil line thin, um, paper thin anatomy directly on the image receptor, but we don't see that. Because of soft tissue, we're gonna to have to increase in, in a OID, if only just a little bit. So there's gonna be presence of magnification. If we're shooting into the bucky, there's a distance between the, the anatomy 
in the image receptor, if only two or three inches. So we're gonna have an increase in OID, we're gonna have magnification present. So magnification factor is always going to be greater than one, right? So um, if you work a, a test question and your answer comes out less than one, you've got your factors flipped, essentially, right? So how we calculate magnification factor is image size over object size. The image size is always going to be larger than the object size, so that's always going to go on top. Or magnification factor is equal to SID over SOD. SID is source to, to image receptor distance, whereas SOD is source to uh, object distance. So what we have to do is subtract our OID from our SID to get our SOD, right? And that's usually the the step that people uh, forget to take. So um, <clears throat> how we control magnification is, is with uh, SID and OID for the most part. We want a minimum OID, acceptable SID. We talked about the, you know, the, the distances that we usually shoot with. And the, in my experience, you know, I've, I've tried to increase SID even further to see if I could get a better benefit out of it. And again, in my experience, I did not. Didn't really uh, add or subtract anything to the image, but it certainly was harder on the x-ray tube, so don't, just don't recommend it. All right, so we can, um, and we're gonna take a look at this here in a minute, we can increase, increase SID to offset increases in OID. We see that when we do a, a chest x-ray, AC joints, lateral C-spine, we shoot 72 inches in order to, uh, you know, decrease the magnification. Well, AC joints, really, it's, it's more of decrease the divergence of the central ray to decrease magnification. It's the same. Um, so we, we shoot at 72 inches in order to avoid that. All right, so magnification is always present for the reasons we just talked about. It's always greater than one. It's always going to be one point something. That point something is going to be your degree of magnification. So, if, like uh, the the example we worked on the board on on Friday, our magnification our magnification factor was 1.02, right? So it, that means that our image size was uh, two percent larger than our object size. Remember that one represents 100 percent. 100 percent just means the whole of something, right? That 0.02 is a percentage, so uh, 0.02 would just be 2% magnification. So then, uh, you know, just to work through another example, if you have an image that uh, you used a 40 inch SID, you had a two inch OID, then how would you work that? Well, you've got your distances. You don't have your image size and your object size, so your first step would be to do what? Subtract OID from SID to get your SOD. So magnification factor would be 40 over 38. And what we would see there is a 5%, an image size that's 5% larger than your object size. Uh, so, you know, I say this a few times this semester, part of what makes this so hard in a digital age is because that might not translate to what you're seeing on the image, on, on your screens, right? So you shoot a hand and it, the, the image size might not come up as the size of the hand that you took an x-ray of. So, you know, some of, of what, what we have to talk about magnification factor and things like that are uh, not really theoretical, it's still valid, it's just that you don't see it, you don't visualize it, and therefore it's, it makes it a little bit more difficult to, to learn. So, but it's present. Uh, you know, we've, we've got a 5% increase in this case in the, the image size or the recorded image size, even if that recorded image size is not the dis display size. So we have a 5%, an image that's 5% larger than the object. And what that translates to, again, is loss of sharpness of recorded detail. And we're gonna talk about that here in a minute uh, with pixels and all that. So, because uh, we've got two different things. We've got record, the recorded image and the display image. So um, we can use an increase in the SID to overcome the uh, change in OID or the increase in OID. So if, for example, our SID remained at 40 inches and we increased our OID to 
four inches, then naturally we, we could expect their magnification to increase, right? And it was five point something before, so you know, I just rounded to, to five. So our magnification would actually increase to 1.11. But if we, in this case, what we did was we doubled um, our OID and left our SID the same, right? So our magnification factor roughly doubled, right? But look directly above that, if we left our OID the same and we increased our SID to 80 inches, then what we're gonna have is a um, magnification factor that was roughly cut in half. Okay, so combining those two things together, what if we doubled our OID, but at the same time doubled our SID, what would you expect to happen? Well, we doubled our SID in the first example, and what happened to our magnification factor? It went down roughly by a factor of two. Right, so we used our original SID and we increased our OID to a factor of two, by a factor of two, and what happened to our magnification factor? It roughly went up by a factor of two. Right, so let's see what happens if you increase both the same amount. Well, it doesn't show it. <laughs> I, I thought I had that slide on there. Um, so, <laughs> shut up. 76, uh, I'm sorry, 80 divided by 76. I don't have enough solar in here to, all right, oh, we'll do it this way. I don't have enough light for that to work. Calculator, 80 divided by 76. So what are we back to? Our original magnification factor, right? So um, if you double your OID and you double your SID, then what effect is that going to give you? It stays the same. It stays the same. It stays the same. Exactly. So, uh, you know, and that's, that's what you call kind of a ratio type thing. Uh, if you, or a ratio type problem. Now, if you if you change your ratio between your SID and your OID by a factor of two, then you can expect a change in factor of, by factor of two. If you change both of them by the exact same amount in the exact same direction, then one negates the other, and you don't have really any change at all. Okay, so double your SID uh, because you had a double of, uh, an increase in OID by factor of two, and what you're going to see is a uh, you know, similar, well, exactly the same uh, magnification as what you had previously. All right, so magnification is size distortion. Decreases sharpness of recorded detail, increases as SID decreases, increases as OID uh, increases. Um, it increases penumbra, penumbra, mag when you have penumbra, that's the bad one, right? So if, if you have an increase in magnification, you're going to have an increase in penumbra. It can be affected by all those things before that we talked about before. Uh, body habits generally increases because the thickness of the patient increases and the object inside of the patient therefore increases. The, the distance, the OID, uh, of the object inside of the patient increases. Uh, body thickness kind of goes along the same way but position is, as well. Um, and then object shape. You want to put your conical shape objects, if at all possible, with the thinnest part away from the image receptor. Um, and spherical objects, you just cannot, cannot overcome it completely. You can minimize it, increase your own uh, SID. So in a digital display, it becomes a little bit more complicated because most of the time you're not going to be working with a, a, a you know, your monitor at your workstation is probably not going to display your anatomy in uh, full size, right? It's, it's going to be smaller. So you shoot a hand, the hand may be this big, but the image on the image receptor may only be, or the image on, on your display may only be, you know, two-thirds of that, right? So it's, it's hard to, to visualize that magnification, but um, it's still present, number one. Um, and we still have a loss of sharpness of recorded detail, actual sharp, sharpness of recorded detail. 
So uh, your display on your on your monitor is going to be in a matrix of pixels, individual pixels. I, I think in Canvas, if you've looked in Canvas, I think I've got a picture, a close-up picture of a dollar bill or something like that. I think it's a hundred dollar bill or something like that. You take that a, a dollar bill out of your pocket and you look at it from a distance and it looks like a picture, a solid picture, right? But if you magnify the image up, what do you see? Do I need to bring up Canvas? My dots. Sure. Uh, lot, yeah, lots of dots, a lot of whole lot of individual dots. So if you look at it very closely, you lose sharpness, uh, the appearance of sharpness, because it's a whole lot of little bitty dots. Well, that's kind of like the matrix um, in your display, but also the individual array of um, image receptors. Your, your big image receptor is made up of a lot of individual little detectors, okay? So uh, the smaller those detectors, the more you can cram into it. So you got two different things working there. Um, in the computer monitor, we'll call that display, uh, I'm sorry, we'll call that a, a, those individual little things, pixels, set into a matrix. So when you go buy a TV, what are you looking for if you want a really, really good image? You want dynamic range, which is depth, you know, the colors and, and all that, but what else are you looking for? the pixel size and the matrix size, right? So uh, if you had a, a TV and it was like, I don't know if you can find this anymore, but if it was like uh, 480 by 720, how sharp is that image gonna be compared to one that's like 5,000 by 7,000? You got high definition in the second example and low definition in the first one, right? So the second one is gonna give you a much better image. And the difference between those two things is not the size of the TV, it's how many of those individual little pixels that they crammed into that box, right? So the smaller we can make them, the more we can pack them in, and the less of a difference you're gonna see, uh, the more less pixelated the image is gonna be, right? So what we want is a, a detector array in the image receptor that has a lot of individual little bitty detectors, okay? Same thing in the display, in your, in your monitor, at your workstation, you want the same thing. You want a lot of individual little bitty pixels, so your, your pixel size should be small, and your array, your matrix size should be large, okay? So, the thing is though, you can't really adjust that, that's number one. Number two is that if you need to magnify an image, you know, you got an image and it's too small to, to make out, the, you think there might be a fracture, you think there might be something going on, but you can't really see it. What do you want to do in order to visualize it better? Click the little magnifying glass, right? So you click the little magnifying glass, that is your magnification function. So when you click that, what it's going to do is it's, it's just going to take what's recorded and what's displayed on your monitor and it's just going to blow it up, okay? Now it's not going to blow it up while leaving those pixels the same size, it's going to blow up the pixels too. So what's naturally going to happen is you're going to lose some sharpness of recorded detail in the magnified image. Okay, so you've got a magnification function that you know, you can magnify the seat a little bit better, but you're gonna lose some. It's gonna get a little bit fuzzier whenever you magnify it up, okay? So what else we see sometimes is collimation can affect the displayed magnification. We've talked about this, and I'm gonna talk about this over and over again because it's a complaint that our, our local radiologists have, have voiced. So um, if you fail to collimate, then what's gonna happen is your computer algorithm takes all the exposure, all of the exposure, and it uh, bases the display size on that exposure. So you, you make your exposure, let's uh, say you, with sophomores, we're going back for upper extremity and we were talking about clavicles uh, yesterday. So you shoot a clavicle, you should collimate down to you know just the clavicle itself. 
right? So the, the computer algorithm is gonna look at your collimated area and the anatomy inside the collimated area. And it's not just gonna adjust contrast and density, but it's gonna adjust uh, display size. So if you don't collimate and you get half of the chest on there, then it's gonna display that, right? It's gonna take that and it's gonna, it's gonna think that you knew what you were doing. Um, and it's gonna display all of that area and it's gonna minimize the size of that clavicle. So it, you know, what should be here, right? In your, um, in your collimated field is now this big, but in order to display that, it's gotta scrunch it down to this big, which makes your clavicle that big, okay? Now, what if you got a subtle fracture in that clavicle? What are you gonna do? You're gonna click the magnifying glass and you're gonna look around on it, but what are you gonna lose? Shrink it. It's not really sharpness or recorded detail, but it is display detail, right? So it kind of works against you. Um, specifically where the where the radiologists were complaining, and I think I mentioned this before, was that you know they, they get x-rays of fingers, um, and instead of shooting an individual finger, they might have shot an entire hand. Right, and not only did they shoot the entire hand, but they didn't really call me down. And then it pops up on the screen. They said, "Oh, I was supposed to shoot a finger." So how do you think you're going to fool somebody in believing you only shot a finger? Sure. Shuddering, right? Shuddering. All right. <clears throat> so once you shudder, uh, you get rid of all that other stuff but your image size doesn't change. It's still gonna come up as a finger that's smaller than what it should have been, okay? So a lot of stuff goes into that though. Uh, not only does your, your lack of collimation affect your image display size, doesn't really affect the, the recorded detail, but the display detail, it does. Looks like a great image, but now the radiologist has to magnify, use magnification function in order to, to see that finger the way he needs to see it, or she needs to see it, right? So you're gonna lose that, that visualization of detail. It's gonna go away. It's, it's not gonna be as sharp. So that's number one. Number two is that you had um, all this data that you were gonna to feed to the radiologist, right? And then you block most of it off. You got rid of most of it. Right, so let's say we're looking at my index finger. What if I've got something that possibly could be a tumor in my pinky finger that would be an incidental finding? And you shuttered all that off. You send that patient home. What's gonna happen? Cancer just magically go away? No, you sent the patient home with a cancer that could have been diagnosed. Did the patient pay for that you know, that, that pinky finger exposure? Well, maybe not monetarily, but in exposure they did, right? So first off, to, to take that route of not collimating is unethical, right? It's, it's your ethical responsibility to limit the dose to the patient. That's number one. But if you make the mistake of not collimating, then it's your ethical responsibility to provide all of the data that you, you know, collected to provide it to the radiologist, right? So to wrap all this up, collimation becomes more important in digital imaging because of that. You know, it, it can affect the display size and if it affects the display size, the radiologist has to use magnification function to make the, the diagnosis your lack of collimation interferes with the radiologist's job to do it, or ability to do their job, right? That's number one. Number two is um, whatever you shoot, provide all that data to the radiologist. Is there a reason to shutter? Is there ever a, a, a purpose for shuttering, a legitimate purpose for shuttering? The answer is yeah. yeah. Let's say you shot a lateral L-spine on a hypersthenic patient. Um, What's a hypersthenic patient gonna create a lot of? Scatter, scatter, right? So where's that scatter gonna go? Well, it's gonna go everywhere. But 
is some of it probably going to hit the image receptor behind the soft tissue on the back of the patient? The answer is yeah, probably will. So what diagnosis can you make off of the, the soft tissue that direct exposes or the, the, the direct exposure behind the soft tissue? It's got a radiation that hits the image receptor behind the soft tissue. Well, that's not patient anatomy. You can't make any kind of diagnosis off of that. So could you shutter that off? Yeah, but should you shutter what's in front of the patient or in front of the L-spine in the abdomen? And the answer is no. Okay, so there is a legitimate reason to shutter, but just because you shot a hand instead of a finger is not one of those reasons, right? Just because you didn't collimate as tightly as you should and you want to give the illusion that you did is not a reason to shut it, right? Provide all the data, that, first off, collimate, and secondly, uh, don't, don't shut her off your collimation. Always go just a little bit wider than the collimation, if that makes sense. Okay. So off my soapbox for the day. All right, so remember we've got a couple of different types of distortion. We've got uh, size distortion, which is all about magnification, and we've got shape distortion. Um, and shape distortion is gonna be uh, elongation and foreshortening. So with shape distortion, what we have is not necessarily a, an increase in, in OID, even though you know we may, may have it, but it's gonna be an unequal magnification because of the distance that the the x-ray beam has to travel from one end of the anatomy to the other. It's easier to see really in foreshortening than what it is in elongation, but it's gonna be present in either one. So with elongation, what we want to show no distortion is of course, you know, adequate SID, low OID, but we also want the anatomy to be parallel with the image receptor and the central ray perpendicular to both. Right? So where we have foreshortening is when one of those things doesn't work out. Okay? So if we have, where we have shape distortion is when one of those things is a little bit different. So where we have uh, foreshortening is generally because maybe the, the central ray and the image receptor are perpendicular to each other, good, but the patient's anatomy is not uh, parallel to the image receptor. So we have a mispositioning of the anatomy. And when I say mispositioning the anatomy, it's not necessarily that you've mispositioned the anatomy, because think of the ribs. Ribs are always gonna have foreshortening, right? Because they're curved. Uh, pelvis, you're gonna have foreshortening with pelvis uh, because of its shape. So it's not necessarily something you did wrong. It could just be the, the patient's anatomy. But generally speaking, when we're talking about distortion, shape distortion, most of the time, most of the time in context of test questions, that's what we're gonna be talking about is mispositioning. So if we have um, uh, foreshortening, what we see is an increase in magnification. Can you see how fat this thing gets on that, that end? How much bigger it appears? I'll put it up a little bit higher so you, those of you in the back can see a little bit better, but you see how, how much fatter it gets. So we have more magnification on the elevated end of this than what we have on the side that's closest to the image receptor. So we have foreshortening in the presence of misalignment of the anatomy. It's not parallel with the image receptor. One end gets fatter, one end remains relatively the same. Some of the shape changes too. Um, you know, it, it appears shorter. That's why we call it foreshortening. Um, so the, the shape of the anatomy, the appearance of the shape of the anatomy, or the length of the, the anatomy um, changes as well. Unequal magnification, foreshortening. Uh, elongation is a little bit more difficult to demonstrate up here. So what we're going to do, I'm going to put Okay, so now instead of passing from front to back, we're going to go sideways, all right? So we've got, uh, we're going to do a towns. A 
again, kind of flying by the seat of my pants here. I've not done this before. Y'all get to be guinea pigs. All right, so give me a central break. So we're gonna do a Towns eventually. We're in a PA projection, right? Can everybody see the, the relative shape of the skull? Okay, so now start passing and try to make it as smooth as possible. No pressure. You see the oh, way it's yeah. starting to change. Kind of wild, huh? Keep going. Go, we're going to go all the way down. Y'all are doing great. Okay, so now we're, you know, at a probably an exaggerated call well. Now we're getting pretty close to a town's. Right? You see what's happening, right? We've got some pretty severe elongation. The, the position of the skull really hadn't changed. It's just, it looks gnarly now, right? It looks like something off of the movie Aliens. Okay, so elongation. That's what you get if, if you imagine the, thank y'all, if y'all imagine the, the image of the towns in the uh, sagmatic arches that we, we talked about on Monday, what did it look like? You, wrong one. Never going to get that right. It looked really stretched out. And, you know, pu public service announcement. When I said light bulb head the other day, you know, we're kind of in a hypersensitive world. I've got the fattest head of anybody that you know, most likely. I wear a big hat. I always had a fat head. So, you know, when I say something like light bulb head, that's to put a visual in, in your mind that, you know, narrow down here, wide up here. Good luck getting zygomatic arches on me. Uh, I got a big head. So, uh, anyway, a little diversion there. So, uh, with elongation, what we have is misangulation of the central ray. And it's not always really misangulation. It's some, sometimes something we can't get past. You're going to have elongation on certain exams, like towns. You're going to have elongation. The skull's going to look all stretched out, right? Sometimes your uh, textbook will, will um, and sometimes your critique book, which we'll go through in your sophomore year, will call elongation elongation, or call it appearance of anatomy elongation when there's truly not elongation going on. So again, looking at our pelvis, where's my half body? Uh, it's way back in the back. All right. Let's see if I can just lift them up. So looking at the pelvis, you've got you can see, uh, well, it just looks like normal pelvis, right? But if I oblique this, then looking at the pelvic wing, the side closest to the screen up here, can you kind of see how it gets a little bit longer in appearance, a little bit flatter, a little bit bigger? Okay, so in a AP of the pelvis, AP of K, or KUB or whatever, what we naturally have is foreshortening. So that oblique, what he gives us the appearance of elongation and kind of the same thing in our ribs. Our ribs, because of their shape, in a normal AP or a PA ribs or chest x-ray, they're naturally foreshortened. As opposed when we oblique, they appear more elongated. So sometimes your textbook will call elongation elong or something that appears longer to be elongation when really it's not. And just understand that that's what's going on. The natural appearance of the anatomy, the ribs are foreshortened, and whenever you're oblique, they appear elongated, even though they're not. All right? So truly elongation occurs when you've got one of two things not in the right position. Either the central ray, like what we just demonstrated, or the central ray's perpendicular, but the image recept receptor is tilted. Okay? So in both of those cases, you're going to have unequal magnification. It's just that you don't see it as well in elongation as what you can in foreshortening. 
the elongation comes in because the diff the distance difference between like when we had the, the flashlight all the way down at the end of the row um, the uh, what was closest to um, the image receptor the screen and the end of the row is going to be the the x-ray beam or in that case a flashlight is going to be closer than this furthest end. Does that kind of make sense? So since our central ray has to, to go a, a longer distance between one portion of the anatomy and the other, we're going to have the appearance of uh, unequal magnification. It's going to be not as detectable as what it is with foreshortening, but it's still present. So that was a long walk to go all the way back up to unequal magnification. It exists in both. We have unequal magnification, both foreshortening and elongation. So what you're gonna look for in your uh, test questions is distortion. It can be one of two things. It can be size or shape distortion, right? Size distortion is magnification and it's always, your test questions are always going to say if it's referring to magnification and it's using distortion, it's always gonna say size distortion. Okay, always going to say size distortion. Or, you know, your question may say, what type of distortion displays equal magnification? What's your answer? Equal magnification, mm -hmm. size distortion. Equal magnification, meaning the entire object is, is magnified equally all the way across. Okay, unequal magnification is shape distortion, right? So if you see a question and you don't see anything about uh, equal increase in size and it just says distortion, automatically assume what we're talking about is shape distortion, okay? So with size distortion, there should be some sort of mention of equal or magnification or somewhere in there um, or uh, you know, size. So one of those things should should be in a, a question for magnification. Size um, equal magnification. Well, those three. Absence of any of that, you're looking at shape distortion. It's elongation for shortening. So which one, you know, do you select on a question? Well, look further into the question. Misangulation of the central ray. Most of the time is going to be Elongation, right? Misangulation of the image receptor. Most of the time it's going to be elongation. Misangulation of the anatomy. Most of the time it's going to be foreshortening. Right. Right. Okay. So uh, I know some of y'all are going to, you probably thinking, well, what about the ribs and the pelvis? That's not going to be on this one. That's number one. Number two is uh, that if I were to ask you a question about that, it'd be something more along the lines of the appearance of elongation, right? Because it's not truly really elongated. And maybe that's my little quirk that I've got to, um, you know, make that uh, distinction. All right, so you can have elongation, um, and this is just a, a demonstration of foreshortening, but you can have elongation without having uh, angulation of central ray, because you always have angulation of central ray. And what I mean by that is your, your x-ray beam diverges, right? So, I've tried to do this before. Let me see if this will work. All right, I still can't get my angulation right. All right, so because of the divergence of, of the light, you know, I've got to angle this to make it as parallel with the, uh, the light field as possible. So if I've got this right here, right, and I, I can't hold that still. Let's try this. All right, notice, I'll put this just flat on here so I can just drag it. 
Notice that the shadow of this doesn't really extend in these two directions. Can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Now watch what happens when I walk that way. What do you see? Shadow. The shadow way over here, right? So because of the divergence of the central ray, what's going to be in the center of your image receptor is really more importantly, the center of your, um, your central ray is going to demonstrate the least amount of distortion. Now let's go up with it. So can you see where the, the shadow is here? Mm. Okay. Watch what happens when I go up. Where the shadow go? It's still there, it's just I can't reach any higher. It's minimized. Um, you know, might not have been able to see that. It's a mess now. Uh, that didn't help at all, did it? <laughs> okay, so can you see it now? There's not a whole lot of shadow on the bottom, right? What happens as I bring it down? It's bigger, right? So dead square in the middle of your central ray, you're gonna have the least distortion, but anywhere in the periphery, you're gonna have, uh, you know, distortion. You're gonna have elongation, really. So when we talk about central ray location, that's the context of it. You wanna put the anatomy of interest right dead square in those crosshairs because that's gonna be your sharpest area. So again, you shoot a hand, right? Well, where do you position your central ray for a hand? Center of the hand, right. So the third metacarpal phalangeal joint, right? So, but you're looking for a finger, right? So where do you put your central ray for a finger? The first interphalangeal joint. Of, if we're looking at the index finger, it'd be the second interphalangeal joint. So are you going to have distortion? If you shoot a hand instead of the finger, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you are. So not only did you overexpose the patient and include more information than what they needed, you shuttered off the information that you shouldn't have exposed to begin with, and you miscentered and you created distortion, right? Okay, now I'm getting back off of my soapbox. Uh, column eight, center in the right place. All right, so you can have, um, you know, elongation even if you don't have a, um, an angulation on central ray because there really pretty much always is angulation. So. All right, what time do we start? Nine. What's that? Forty-four minutes. Forty-four minutes. Okay. got enough time to get much into this. So just to kind of um, introduce it. All right, so factors affecting distortion. We got object thickness. Um, object thickness is going to play a part in a lot of different ways. All right, so we talked about magnification. Right, the thicker the object um, or the thicker the patient, hypersthenic patient or whatever, we're going to have naturally an increase in OID with that increase in OID, what we're gonna see is magnification. But we can also have uh, shape distortion there as well. Okay, so let's go back to this. All right, so we've got a nice round shape, you know, nice round shape here, nice round shape here. And if I have an increase in OID, my round shape is gonna appear more dramatic, okay? or my, my distortion is going to appear more dramatic, all right? But in addition to that, because of the divergence of the central ray, let's say I've got a nice round anatomy, and it's, um, it is within the patient's body, uh, you know, towards the periphery, all right? Towards the periphery, uh, but it would be on the image receptor, but because it's thick, you know, far away from the, the uh, image receptor, we've got an increase in OID, it can be projected off of the image receptor. Does that kind of make, make sense? 
In addition to that, it can be projected somewhere where it doesn't look like it should be. Okay, so there's a phenomenon that's called parallax. And parallax in this context basically means seeing something where it's not. Anybody done a, um, a lumbar puncture or myelogram? Okay, got a couple of nods. Where does the radiologist or the PA want to see the needle in that exam? On the, not inside the patient, but on the, the fluoro screen. Where, where do they want to see it? Dead square in the center. Dead square in the center, right? And this is why. I don't know that I can really demonstrate this very well. This is why. Because if we have this, pretty perpendicular to the, the screen. And this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna try to plumb this out. So it's pretty perpendicular to the screen if I go right like that, okay? So shadow is pretty minimal, right? But if I back up over here, what's it look like? Got a lot of distortion, right? So you're doing a myelogram with a patient. Where are they putting a needle? Where are they trying to put the needle? Doing a myelogram. Basically in the sac around the spine, right? So if you were the patient on the table, would you want the distortion on the screen for the guy who's sticking a needle into your spine? You would, I hope you would say no, you would not, all right? So that, though, is going to get worse with an increase in OID. I mean, look, look what's going to happen. Let's say we'll put it right on the edge here. If I increase my OID because I've got a thick patient, what happened to the end of it? It's gone. It's gone, right? Parallax, all right? So not only does object thickness in the specific object that, that we want to see change um, the, the appearance of the object, but also where the object lies inside of the patient along with the thickness of the patient. Okay? So kind of all tied in, kind of make a little bit of sense? So object thickness, uh, object position, we kind of talked about object position, we want the, the object, uh, you know, in spines, we've got specific ways that, that the central ray would follow the divergence of the central ray better, or the, the anatomy would follow the divergence of the central ray better. Object shape, what kind of uh, objects can you never overcome an increase in OID with? Spherical or round, right. Um, central ray angulation, central ray angulation is gonna give us um, uh, elongation, if we have the um, uh, angulation of the anatomy, it's going to be foreshortening, and central ray centering can also cause elongation as well. All right, <coughs> so why don't we pull up there? Any questions? Thanks for playing along. Uh, I'm glad that worked out one of these days. Uh, you know, I've, I've done things just kind of on the fly that just did not work out at all. Um, and I learned lessons in those cases. Um, not to do that anymore, being one of those things. Okay, then I'll see y'all on.